last lesson, we learned that when you were baptized into Christ, you received the Holy Spirit of God. He, in conformity with his own personal desire, as announced by the prophets of God, promised by Jesus Christ, and confirmed by the apostles of Christ, sent the Holy Spirit into your hearts. As Galatians, the fourth chapter, testifies, because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. How God has loved you to give you of his own Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit came into your life, he came to confirm that you were God's son, to give you the confidence and assurance that you had been joined unto the Lord, and to produce in you that divine fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, of love, joy, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faith, these heavenly attributes that enable you to live godly in this present evil world. Now in this next installment, we want to consider you being raised and quickened or made alive to God in your baptism. Our texts are taken from two books, the books of Romans and Colossians. First, Romans, the sixth chapter and verse four. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And in Colossians, the second chapter, and verse 13, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. In the kingdom of God, sensitivity to God is of the highest priority, that you'll be alert to him, sensitive to him, able to hear him when he speaks to your heart able to discern him when he moves in your behalf, is of critical importance in the things of God. This attribute of sensitivity to God is what made Jacob, the patriarch, and David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, particularly close to God. In Romans, the ninth chapter and verse 13, God confesses, Jacob, have I loved. And in Acts, the 13th chapter and verse 22, in reference to David, he is described as the man after God's own heart. Now, it was not the moral achievements of these individuals that made them precious to God. Not only had they had success in being morally acceptable to God, but they had had dramatic failures as well. The thing that made them acceptable to God, rather than moral attainments or their works or achievements, was their sensitivity to God. They were able to recover themselves from setbacks because they were alert, sensitive, and aware of the living God. Such an individual is precious to him. God, you see, has no pleasure in those that draw back and recoil from him. In one of the most profound announcements of Scripture, God indicates to us his extreme displeasure with those that are afraid of him and draw back from him and do not come near to him. In the book of Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verses 38 and 39, God goes on record. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them that draw back to perdition, but of them which believe to the saving of the soul. Now let there be no mistake about this in your thinking. To recoil from God, to be hesitant to come to him, to be insensitive to God, displeases God. He has no pleasure in those that so react to him. But he does greatly delight in those that are alert, sensitive, aware of him, desire him, and find their heart's greatest pleasure in him. Now we are touching on this area of sensitivity in our consideration of you being raised and made alive to God in your baptism. Actually, you were raised from death in trespasses and sins as Colossians 2.13 tells us. You were dead in your sins, that is, you were insensitive to God, unaware of his will for you, and quite unwilling to live for him. You did not receive him as he was, but stood back afar off from him, recoiled from him, and like the Israelites at Sinai, were afraid to come to him. But you have been in your baptism raised from that spiritual death and made alive, sensitive, and receptive to the living God. 
in consideration of death, spiritual death, alienation from God, separation from God, or as it is called, death and trespasses and sins, this death resulted from sin. The Scriptures tell us in Romans, the fifth chapter and verse 12, that Adam sinned, and by sin, death entered into the world. And death ruled and reigned over the race of man because of sin. Transgression alienated men from God, made them incapable of hearing His voice. It's as though men were moved beyond the perimeter of God's voice. They were not within the circumference of the vision of God's will. They were unaware of Him, unable to please Him, unable to see Him as He really is. Thus, distorted views of God's de God developed by those dead in trespasses in sin. Sin slays the person by defiling their conscience, making them more aware of their sin than they are aware of God. Thus, their own guilt overshadows the awareness and appreciation of the living God. In Romans, the seventh chapter and verse 11, the Apostle Paul puts language to this concept. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. That is to say, sin made me aware that God was displeased with me, but gave me no ability to discern God would receive me. It deceived me. It made me reconcile myself to be an enemy of God, and thus caused me to be ensnared fully by sin. That's the meaning of spiritual death. Away from God, persuaded that God will not receive you, and alienated from God, unable to understand and perceive His Word, unable to associate the vicarious sacrifice of Christ with you, unable to identify the blessings and promises of God with your own case. You in your baptism were raised, elevated from that state, and made alive to God. In further amplification of this truth of spiritual death, John the Apostle, in his first epistle, 1 John, the fifth chapter and verse 12, says this, He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. So spiritual death, speaking from a negative viewpoint, is simply not having the life of God. And those who do not have Christ, who have not been baptized into Christ, who have not put on Christ and been made a partakers of Christ, these individuals are without life, in a state of spiritual death. Death, as we have asserted, entered into the world by sin as Romans 5, verses 12 through 14 assert. Thus, a wedge was driven between God and man, a gulf formed that the voice of God made it impenetrable to the man's heart. Man contented himself to live at a distance from God. He was alienated from God, actually contrary to God. His thoughts were not God's thoughts. His ways were not God's ways. And as if that were not enough, they competed with God's thoughts and ways. God, as it were, were working in one, was working in one direction and man was working in another. Spiritual death not only separates from God, it thrusts you in the opposite direction of the living God. You become incompatible with God, contrary to God. As Amos the prophet said, how can two walk together except they be agreed? You and God, when you were dead in sin, could not walk together because you were not agreed. That's what spiritual death consists of. Jesus, however, by the grace of God, came to remedy this situation. And the remedy was not simply to tell man what he ought to do, to correct, as it were, his habits of life, to bring a new way of life. His way to correct the remedy was to bring life. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, I am come that you might have life, and that you might have it more abundantly. The thing that offsets death is life. Being made alive to God, aware of Him, brought up into an area where the awareness of God supersedes the awareness of this present evil world. Now may I take a moment just to ask you a personal question. Are you more aware of this world or the world to come? Do your own problems and vexations 
do they loom larger to you than God himself? If such is the case, and you have been baptized into Christ, my job is to apprise you that you have been made alive unto God, and that by faith and capitalizing upon what you have in Christ Jesus, God can become more real to you than your problems. The world to come can become more real to you than this present evil world. That is spiritual life. Jesus gave himself for the life of the world. Twice he asserted this in the sixth chapter of John. Verse 33 is the first place. Hear this word of the Lord. For the bread of God, and Jesus is the bread of God. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life to the world. Again in this same chapter, verse 51, Jesus, as though he wants us to be sure to grasp this, says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Jesus wants you to be alive and sensitive to God, to be alert to him and able to be used by God in this world, able to be oriented now for heaven and the world to come. Thus, where sin abounded, grace has much more abounded. Sin slew us, took us away from God, and caused death to dominate. But Jesus came in and slew sin, took it out of the way, purged it, and when we obeyed the gospel, made us alive unto God, undoing all of the death that sin had caused. Jesus thus has done infinitely more than Satan has done. Thank God for it and praise his almighty name that you have been made alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now it's worthy that we assert the accomplishments that are proclaimed concerning this spiritual life, life in Christ Jesus. Life is, Jesus is after all the life giver. He is not primarily a law giver. The word of the Lord tells us in the first chapter of John that the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Christ. Christ's primary ministry is not merely to tell you what to do, although he will guide you and tell you what to do. His primary and fundamental ministry is to bring you life and to bring it more abundantly so that you can experience a living, vibrant, consistent relationship with the living God. After all, God has no dead children. There are no stillbirths in the kingdom of God. God is a living God and only has living children. My job is to convince you that you are alive in Christ Jesus. You hath he quickened, the scriptures tell us, Ephesians the second chapter, verses 1 and 5. You hath he quickened, an old word meaning made alive. Colossians, the second chapter and verse 13, our text says the same thing. And you hath he quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins. He's made you alive. Well, you may say, I don't feel alive. I feel as though I'm unaware of God, insensitive of God. If you've been baptized into Christ, if you've been buried with him by baptism into death, the apostle asserts, as he was filled by the Spirit, this is God's message to you, God quickens you and made you alive. You arose to walk in newness of life. Now, dear believer, you can't walk in life if you don't have it. And the apostles tell us, you have received life in Christ Jesus. Walk in it. You were made alive in your baptism. That means that you prefer and you perceive the, an active association with God. You sense in your soul that God not only desires you, but you can walk with him. You can please him. You can read his word and understand it and discern it and walk in the light as he is in the light. That's what it means to be alive unto God, to actually engage in what he tells you to do and know you're going to get it done because he has given you divine resources. You see, only those who misunderstand God 
draw back from him. God is good. He's tender and full of compassion and merciful. He considers our frame and pities us and knows us. He has given us all the resources we need to make it from earth to heaven. You know there are only two places, here and there. And there are only two times, now and then. And the objective for all men is to make it from here to there. And to make it from now till then. Jesus, by quickening you, making you alive, raising you from the dead, has brought you into a realm where all the resources exist which are necessary to get from here to there and from now to then. You must avail yourself of them. You must receive them by faith and say, by the grace of God, I'm going to press toward the mark. I'm going to deny ungodliness and I'm going to lay hold of eternal life, as the scripture says. These are aspirations of a living person. Rejoice in the life that you have in God. Rejoice in it and walk in it. Is not this the admonition of Scripture? Above that, the revelation of Scripture. We were buried with Christ by baptism into death. That just like Jesus was raised up by the glory of the Father, even so we also might rise to walk in newness of life. Believe that. Receive it in the name of the Lord. You have been planted together in the likeness of his death, Romans 6, 5 says. You are going to also be in the likeness of his resurrection. That is, you not only died with him, you live with him also. You are quickened together with Christ. Thus you have fellowship with him. He walks with you. You have companionship with him. You don't bear your burdens alone anymore. As the word of the Lord tells us, you can boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I shall not fear what man shall do unto me. You may be now going through a trial, a test of some sort. If you are in Christ Jesus, you are not going through it alone. The Lord is there with you. And your life in Christ Jesus enables you to appreciate it and to capitalize upon it. To summarize briefly what spiritual life is, it is sensitivity and productivity. Sensitivity to God. That is to say you come to God convinced that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You hear the Lord because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. You hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You're sensitive about His will, about His revelation, about the imposition of His will upon your life. You're cognizant of it and want it and desire it. You're alive, sensitive to Him. And you work together with God, laboring with Him, taking your part in the yoke of Christ. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. Get under it with me. When you're sensitive to God, you do that. You're also sensitive to truth. You receive the truth. God's word is a message of reality. It's not just a message of do's and don'ts, of rules, manners of life and habits. The word of God conveys to you things that really are. It tells you of a real God and a real Christ and a real heaven and a real inheritance that's waiting for you in Christ Jesus. It tells you of real resources that are yours now, righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Spirit. And as you're sensitive to those truths, you are alive unto God. It also makes us sensitive to responsibility, that when the Lord gives us something to do, we do it. When he commands us, we go. The word of the Lord says, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Now, when the Lord speaks to you through his word, when he says, awake to righteousness and sin not, and you're sensitive to that, and you determine to awake to righteousness and sin not, that's your evidence of spiritual life. Now, there are certain results that accrue from being alive, and they involve your reasoning processes. 
Here at this point, we want to encourage you to be a thinker in the kingdom of God. God's people are a thoughtful people because they're in the image of God and have received a gospel that is a well-thought-out, deliberate gospel. You capitalize upon salvation by learning to think properly about it, in faith, receiving the truth of God. In Romans, the sixth chapter in verse 11, the apostle teaches us to reason properly. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now we enter into the realm of practicality here. Reckon yourself to be dead to sin and alive unto God. Reckon in Scripture means proceed on this basis in your reasoning. Contemplate life from this perspective. You're dead to sin and you're alive to God. Now why the need for an exhortation like this? Simply because it does not seem from time to time like we are really dead to sin and really alive to God circumstances and situation seems to contradict this principle. But now God has spoken. Your faith must anchor itself in the Word of God, not in experience, not in circumstance. God has said, you are buried with baptism, by baptism, into Christ's death, and He quick, God quickened you and raised you from death and trespasses and sins and made you alive to God. That's the divine assessment of your baptism. Now, you reason along those lines. When you seem too sensitive to sin, reckon yourself. Reason upon this. Say, I am dead indeed unto sin and alive unto God. God said it, and I'm going to believe what God said. When you do this, divine strength is imparted to you, which will enable you to live above sin. There's a parallel to this in some of our Lord's miracles. On one occasion, Jesus healed a man that was a paralytic that lay on a pallet all his life. Jesus looked at this paralytic and said, Arise, take up thy bed, and walk. The man had not walked all of his life. It was physically impossible to walk. But when in his will he exerted himself to obey the word of the Lord, the divine power that accompanied Christ's word enabled him to stand up and to walk. Now, your experience against sin is much like that. The Lord tells you, awake to righteousness and sin not. Go thy way and sin no more. Well, you say, I'm not able to do it. But when your will is vitalized by the word of God, and when you become determined, I will obey the Lord, divine power is given to you, life is given to you to obey what the Lord has said. Yield yourselves to God as people that are alive from the dead. Romans, the sixth chapter, and verse 13 teaches us this. Yield yourselves to God. Submit yourself to Him as a person that's alive from the dead. Your own personal feeling may seem to contradict this. Your experience may seem to contradict this. But if you've been baptized into Christ, and if what God has said is the truth, then you can yield yourself to God. You can submit yourself to righteousness. You can cause your body to serve God rather than sin. You must believe God on these things. Again, the word of the Lord tells us in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, cleanse yourself of all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. Get out of your life things that are contrary to God. You do it. God won't take it out for you. You've got to get rid of it yourself. To get rid of it, you must have this view that you're alive to God and dead to sin, the real you. See, in Christ, there's actually two of you. There's the person that's not regenerate, the old nature, the part that's tempted. And there's a part of you that is regenerated, that has been renewed, the new man. That's the one you must listen to. And you must refuse to give in to the old nature that says, serve sin, serve sin. Say, I'm alive to God and dead to sin. Reckon yourselves to be this matter. Do not serve sin, Romans 6, verses 6 through 8 says. Do not serve sin. Don't do it. How can you obey that? By reasoning like God reasons.
I'm dead to sin and alive unto God. Now let's review briefly what we have learned in this session. It is an arresting truth indeed. We have learned that when we were baptized into Christ Jesus, we were made alive to God. Not a physical type life, a spiritual alertness to the divine will, an ability to respond to God and to please Him. This happened when you were baptized. In the awareness of this, as you know this, receive it by faith, you'll be able to cleanse yourself of things that are displeasing. You'll be able to separate yourself from things that God does not want in your life. It's life that enables you to overcome sin. It's life that enables you to overcome death. Sin will try and assert itself, to be sure, but you must deny ungodliness. The grace of God will teach you this. In Titus, the second chapter, verses 11 and 12, tells us that the grace of God which bring us salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present evil world. Now, a person that is alive to God is teachable. The grace of God can properly instruct him how to avoid sin and the snares of life and go happily on his way to heaven. You are now a stranger in this world. I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts that war against the soul. Now being alive to God is what has made you a stranger and a pilgrim in the world. If you don't feel at home in the world, if you feel a strangership to this world, if you feel closer to heaven than you are to earth, if you feel closer to God than you are to men. The reason is because you're alive. This is your confirmation. When you were baptized into Christ, you arose to walk in a newness of life, spiritual life, sensitivity to God. I admonish you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ now to walk in the newness of life, to put on all of the advantages that have been given you in Christ Jesus. And dear brother or sister, be not faithless, but believing.